Can you hear me and see my presentation, Donato? Yes, we, we can hear you. Yeah. Fantastic. So first of all, thank you, Thomas and Donato, for uh, uh, for this invitation. And apologies for uh, missing uh, the workshop yesterday, but uh, Australian time was in the middle of the night, so I did my best and I ended up falling asleep. Uh, the show was great, and I look forward to to watch the, the record. So today I'm excited uh, to uh, show you uh, some uh, recent results from an ambitious project that me and my collaborators uh, have been running over the last couple of years, considering COVID and some of the delays we had, that it's about using uh, biological inspired robots to study ecology and evolution of fishes and even control invasive species. So today I'm particularly excited uh, because uh, my collaborator and I got a paper accepted on nature and uh, who knows how often this will happen in the lifetime, so please just uh, understand my extra enthusiasm uh, today's a day. All right. Um, I am originally from uh, Rome in Italy and for some of you that uh, have followed uh, the European Soccer Cup recently, you might know that this is the city where the cup has been uh, delivered, so congratulations to our team. But I am nowadays based on uh, the opposite side of the world, that is on the west coast of Australia. People might know Perth if they are into surfing. This is uh, the city where the World Cup of Surf uh, uh, is hosted every year. But uh, don't expect this is my life now, because here we are in the uh, core of the winter, so it's more like what Christmas would be in the Northern uh, Hemisphere. So something very brief about me before I jump into robotics. So I am a behavioral ecologist uh, by training, and uh, I am uh, interested in how animals cope with changes. And I've been doing so by looking at changes uh, in the uh, social opportunities, changes uh, in uh, life experience that happened during the ontogeny, changes in the habitat, and recently even uh, including uh, the presence of pollutants or contaminants, or changes uh, that uh, uh, refer or relate uh, to mating opportunities. And uh, I have done some of these analyses, uh, uh, taking advantage of uh, biologically inspired uh, robots uh, and uh, uh, the uh, invaluable uh, benefit that uh, I will try to explain that they might give us. But for the uh, purpose of this talk, I will talk about uh, uh, fishes that, as you can see, is one of the main models uh, that I use in my analysis, but bad fishes. So fishes that are pest, fishes that uh, are so-called uh, invasive. So invasive species are a bad thing, and are a bad thing uh, that uh, is now covering the entire globe. So uh, the problem is that uh, invasive species uh, are bad for uh, our health, are bad for our economy, if you, look at, if you think about agricultural pests, and are especially bad for biodiversity. For biologists, uh, ecologists, uh, evolutionary biologists that are in the audience, you might know very well that invasive species uh, are uh, the second largest cause for biodiversity loss globally just second to the um, habitat degradation. And the number of invasive species that uh, are colonizing uh, the world is increasing exponentially since uh, industrialization. Interesting, some of the worst invasive species are fishes. And today I will talk about the guy in the middle. It's like a small fish, about three, four centimeters. It's called uh, Gambusia or Brucai, or better known as uh, mosquito fish. And it's interesting because uh, uh, the International Union for Conservation of Nature has listed this species as one of the 100 world worst uh, invasive uh, threat. Why are they so bad? Despite they're so small, they are actually predators. And so what they do, they eat eggs and larvae of uh, small fishes or amphibians. And uh, especially for amphibians, so here you see pictures of uh, tadpoles and froglets, this pest bites uh, the uh, tails and the legs, uh, causing malformities, uh, infections, uh, and often death. So in many places in the world where this invasive species is present, uh, frogs are disappearing. And uh, unless uh, in the audience, there is someone that is uh, from Antarctica. 
this invasive species it's everywhere and uh, methodologies to eradicate them or at least uh, mitigate their effect on the biodiversity are so far unknown so a few years back me and my collaborators uh, thought whether we could use robots to understand uh, the vulnerabilities of these otherwise extremely successful uh, colonizer. And we did it by transferring information from the main predator of this species in the environment where the species is native, that is North America. We transfer this information to a robot, information related to the morphology and mainly to the locomotion. So what we found is that uh, a robot that looks like and moves like a predator, and especially that is capable of interacting in real time with our pest, induce anxiety and stress that uh, it's uh, strong enough to alter the behavior of our pest. So in this technical study, we figured out how to develop a tool that can allow us to understand the vulnerabilities of a very successful colonizer. But now, if in the audience you are an ecological, a behavioral ecologist or an evolutionary biologist as I am, the first exciting question that would come out after you read this result is, do these effects persist in the long term understanding long-term as uh, relative to the lifespan of a fish. And also, do these effects extend beyond behavior? So do they impact uh, other traits that are less flexible than behavior? Because if this happens, we then uh, strongly uh, uh, focus on uh, the ecology and uh, evolution of uh, uh, the fish. So at that point, we can start to move beyond behavior and enter in a range of analysis that include more traits. So to put it in a more like uh, general terms, I think in the last year and a half, uh, all of us have experienced the effect of stress and especially how close to the pandemic mainly, a small little event can have large repercussions on the mood and our behavior. But we also know from our own experience and from the human literature that effect of stress move beyond behavior. So this guy, we can imagine that uh, during his year of uh, years of presidentship in the United States went through a lot of stress. And uh, you can see how his hairs from being black became white. This is one of many effects that uh, stress might have on our health. Another one that is very well known is the effect that it has on fertility. So both males and females, so men and women, under high stress, they face lower fertility rates. So much that one of the most common treatments against infertility is actually trying to reduce the level of stress in our life. So we thought, is this also true for animals? And if so, can we use this? as a tool to uh, deliver and inject stress into a system uh, through the lens of a robot. And so this is the objective of the study that uh, I'm presenting now. So understanding whether a biologically inspired and interactive robot is capable to alter the behavior of a pest in the long term, compromise survival and reproduction of the pest, but also cause a benefit for native amphibian, amphibians that coexist with the pest. So my students and I had fun in uh, moving around uh, the region uh, in Perth, visiting different uh, freshwater bodies uh, and collect uh, wild uh, animals uh, of both uh, the invasive species, uh, so the mosquito fish, and native tadpoles of a frog that is very common in our area and is known to be negatively impacted by the invaders. So where the invader is abundant, the frog is not present. This is a little fish, so it took a while to get enough animals, but we managed. We carried all of these animals back into the lab and we uh, distributed them into mesogosms. Uh, that is nothing else than just a very large tank 
that uh, in the eyes of a fish or a tadpoles resemble in some way the environments where they belong. So there are some uh, shelters, uh, there is some vegetation, and, uh, and we house the uh, six mosquito fish and six tadpoles in each of these mesogosms, uh, balancing the sex ratio of uh, the mosquito fish. Of course, we couldn't detect the sex of the tadpoles at a larval stage, so that was unknown. And we have um, tested the, the group behavior of these tadpoles and mosquito fish from each group twice a week for seven consecutive weeks in an apparatus that looked like this. So we have an experimental arena in which uh, we have our six tadpoles and our six mosquito fish. And then we divided randomly half of the groups of tadpoles and mosquito fish into uh, treatment groups, so animals that have been exposed to the robot, and the other half were controlled, so animals that have never seen the robot in their life. Now, for the animals that were exposed to the robot, we did mount a webcam on top of the arena in a way that uh, we could see the environment inside. We connected the webcam to a computer in which there was an algorithm that was tracking each individual animal of each individual species of each individual group in real time and delivering this information through a robotic manipulator with three degrees of freedom that uh, was translating a robotic replica that was present inside the arena. So inside the arena, there was the actual body of uh, the uh, robotic predator, the eyes were the camera, the brain was the algorithm, and the legs were the manipulator. The groups that have not experienced the robot were tested in the same arena without the robotic replica inside. With this apparatus, we have tested how the group behavior of these two species changes depending on whether there is a, a robotic predator interacting uh, with them in real time. But then also, we measured the, the behavior in the mesocosm of the fishes days and weeks after the exposure to the robot. So this was not an acute effect. We actually wanted to check whether this experience with the robot had repercussion on the natural behavior of the past days and weeks after this experience uh, was concluded. And after that, we measure traits that are so-called life history traits. So traits that relate to changes in body morphology, in uh, um, fat content, so energy storage is a proxy of health in fishes, and fertility. So we measure from males, uh, sperm number and quality, and in females, we measure the, the number and weight of eggs. So the experimental design then looks like this. We have an experimental arena in which uh, we measure group behavioral effects in the short term, so responses to the robot, and what we measure especially is uh, sociality, activity, and space use for each species, so tadpoles and mosquito fish. And to give you a flavor of uh, how much uh, uh, computational analysis this, uh, uh, this is, we ended up with 168 one hour long trials in which we have uh, behavioral responses of each individual of each species uh, every fraction of a second. And then we measure the consequences, as we said, of this interaction with the robot weeks after uh, this uh, event happened. So we looked at the long-term effect of these events, and we did so by looking at the individual level for each mosquito fish at uh, the feeding rate and routine activity in their mesogosm tank, so away from the stress of an experimental arena. And again, to give you a flavor, we ended up with 672 trials, five minutes long. It was a massive effort. It took a bit. And finally, we measured the, the life history traits related to energy reserves, body shape, and body fertility for each fish. So what did we get? So let's, uh, I will drive you through these uh, results, uh, starting from the acute effect that happened into the experimental arena. So the histograms in black, are histograms that relate to the robot exposed treatment. And the light gray is the control. 
So you can see that uh, mosquito fish and tadpoles responded uh, to the robots in an opposite way for a classic measurement of anxiety. So mosquito fish exposed to the robot uh, had a more chaotic and anxious way of swimming compared to mosquito fish that uh, never experienced the robot. Well, tadpoles did the opposite. So their uh, movement uh, was much less anxious in presence of the robot. Both species uh, swam longer when the robot was present. And this is because, of course, there was more, more activity within the arena that might have required more motion. But their space use, uh, again, was significantly different from control to treatment in opposite way between the species. So mosquito fish, in presence of the robot, spent significantly more time in the center of the arena because they were trying to run away from the sides where the robot was actually striking. This allowed the tadpoles uh, to spend more time toward the sides that is away from their natural enemy. And we used, a, so, I think, a very elegant mathematical uh, uh, tool to understand causality. And so if you think about the arena with our three actors, the tadpoles, the robot, and the mosquito fish, we observed that uh, the movement of the robot had an effect only on uh, mosquito fish. And changes in behavior of mosquito fish had a subsequent effect that caused changes in the behavior of the tadpoles. So the robot uh, scared the mosquito fish only. And indirectly, this was beneficial for the tadpoles. Now, the effect effect on the long term, so the behavior observed in their housing tank, we found that the effect were very strong. And so fishes that uh, days or weeks before had faced the robot uh, differ substantially in both uh, measurements of anxiety and uh, activity, like freezing. Freezing means immobility, but also is the classic proxy for anxiety. So animals that have seen the robot in the past were more anxious and less mobile than animals that never did, although the, the robot was not present. And these anxious and the low mobile animals also ate more when they had the chance to do it. This is interesting because if you think about now a housing enclosure where these animals are living together, mosquito fish and the native tadpoles, if now the pest is resting much longer and hiding in the vegetation, because he's uh, anxious and because he's low mo mobile, then these uh, release a lot of pressure on the other species that coexist with this aggressive invader. And then finally, another very exciting result was to look at the effect of this exposure uh, to the robot in terms of life history. And so we found that both males and females decreased their body condition, so their fat content. This is, a, uh, in both cases, a significant drop. Now, if you look at it, it might not seem very big, but the truth is, is that it's more than the threshold of 5% of drop in fat content that is known in the literature to have severe consequences for the survival of uh, an individual, because uh, when individuals in, in nature face uh, a random lack of nutrients or when they need uh, energy to fuel uh, strong functions like run away from a predator, they need to rely on the storage of energy that they have. And uh, on that body, losing uh, that percentage uh, indicates uh, substantial consequences. This is something we have observed in both species, uh, weeks, sorry, in both sexes, weeks after the exposure to the robot. And the same effect was also evident in terms of fertility. Actually, the drop in sperm number and eggs weight in males and females was substantial in a way that uh, males produce much less sperm and females much less eggs. This had uh, a fascinating repercussion on the whole body morphology of the fishes. So I try to do my best, but I think that the figure is kind of small. But if you can see this red line here, this red profile, this is how the body shape of the fish is changed at the end of the experiment. So animals that had experienced uh, uh, the uh, robotic predator in the past, 
developed a more slim and hydrodynamic body morphology that facilitate, this is a common example in the ecology of these species, these morphologies are known in animals adapted to high predation levels because uh, uh, this morphology allows them to run away and escape uh, uh, more effectively. So it looks like this fish that invested a lot of energy in adapting their way of being to survive to a predator that in the reality doesn't exist at the cost of their health and their reproduction. So just to recap the objective of the study we had at the beginning, we wanted to test whether our biological inspired and interactive robot can alter the behavior of our pest in the long term, impacting the survival and reproduction and have a beneficial result for the native amphibians that coexist with this pest. And what we found indeed is that brief exposures to our robot alter the group dynamics in both species in, in opposite ways. So the robot increase the antipredator responses and anxiety in mosquito fish, and this in turn decreases stress anxiety in the uh, tadpoles. But not only, this acute effect in the arena extended to the routine behavior observed weeks after the exposure and measured in the housing enclosure where the animals have been living, including uh, changes in routine activity and in feeding rate of mosquito fish that have caused a loss in energy reserves, a variation in their entire body shapes and a dramatic drop in fertility in both sexes. We found that this, is, this was very cool because uh, it was the first time that uh, a robotic uh, tool was capable to reveal the Achilles heel of this uh, incredibly successful colonizer. Because with brief action, selectively targeting uh, the bad guy in real time, we were able to unbalance the energy budget allocated to survival versus reproduction. So we forced the individuals to adjust their way of being to survive better to predation at the cost of being much less efficient in reproducing. So in conclusion, what this study shows is that uh, robotics is a great resource to study the cost of predation threat in animals far beyond behavior. And it gave us a control that we would never have with live agent in which a predator typically eats a prey. But not only, these uh, uh, predator mimicking robots uh, can actually be extremely useful in terms of application because they can allow us to build uh, developmental, ecological, and evolutionary vulnerability of invasive species. And therefore, collecting information that so far are not used in uh, um, biocontrol uh, strategies uh, that might actually become extremely relevant or important considering that uh, so far the strategies we have have not worked as much. So now bringing this in the context of the special session where we are, so socializing and eco integrating robots with living organisms, in our perspective, two are the innovations that this study is bringing. The first one, is that uh, we do have uh, a technology to control target animals within the ecological community in which they inhabit. So we can understand what happens in a complex systems and target certain animals, but not others. And secondly, that the robots, especially the biological inspired robots we have observed here, can actually allow us to study ecology and evolution uh, in the animal realm uh, with a precise uh, approach that we have never had before. And uh, please allow me to help to uh, thank the international team that contributed to the study that is under revision and we hope to have out soon, that are uh, um, Brishin Soman and Mert Karagaya. Uh, from NYU. Then we have two experts in fish reproduction, so Clelia, Professor Clelia Gasparini and John Evans, and uh, a long-term collaborator Maurizio Porfiri from NYU. And uh, allow me to thank all of you for the attention, and I hope I've not been too long. Thank you.
Thank you, Giovanni. Thank you, Giovanni. Impressive presentation and perfect time. Um, you produced, you triggered several reactions in the audience. So there are quite uh, oh, sorry, uh, I can, yeah. numerous mm -hmm. questions for you. So we have, um, can you hear me? Yes, right. Um, yes. So we, we read some of these questions. We have a few minutes to, to reply to them. And then in case you can continue by chatting. Okay, so first question is by Lana S. Let's say, one that, uh, one that cause a selective advantage for fish that are reproductively resistant to stress. So if it, it can be an advantage for a fish to become resistant to stress, this is the question. Yes, if you produce a sort of new, uh, an evolved species, you know, a species compared to, to the rest of the population that resist to distress, so they are uh, not anymore affected by the stress, robotic stressors. I think I this see. is the... Yeah. Okay, very good question. So let me say first the limitations, of course, of the study, that is uh, analyzing the lifespan of an animal, but not going beyond it. So whether then the offspring of this animal that although will be few, still there will be some, whether these offspring will uh, inherit information from their parents about, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, dangerous world and they would be better able to cope with that than their parents have been, we don't know. So of course this call for extra analysis. But what I can say from a general biological perspective is that, uh, um, there is an, so if you think mathematically, there is an, an X amount of energy that you get through food, right? And you need to use this budget of energy for competing functions. Some of these functions require to invest energy to run away, to shape your body in some way. And then uh, some of these functions require to breathe. So now if you have an X amount of uh, energy and you use a lot in one, you don't have much left for the other. So if uh, they need to run away from a predator and they believe that this is a predator, uh, most likely they will have less energy to deal with other functions like reproduction. So our expectation is that actually this will be something that we might continue to observe. It's basically just uh, convincing them that uh, this predator is real and then uh, just going with the flow will happen in nature when uh, they actually face a real predator. Thank you, very clear. And then second question by uh, Victoria Rajewitz. Let's say, is it possible to ensure that outside of the lab, the stressors only affect the focused species and not the entire ecosystem? So on, this is on the selectivity of this method. It is a, again, a very good question. So I think that uh, Thomas uh, before like gave a, an idea of uh, how complex it can be to scale things uh, across the species uh, uh, from one ecosystem to another. And even more when you want to apply these things in uh, the most complex system ever that would be like nature. I don't know. So of course uh, we are now playing with two actors. Uh, one is a tadpole and one is a fish. Now, whether we can refine this selectivity so much to be sure that we are affecting again only one animal, even when it's surrounded by a hundred other species, uh, again, require analysis. But um, I would say this is the encouraging thing. This was not a shot in the dark. So this is not something that happened. There was a, there was a choice for the choice uh, of the species that, uh, that we, we worked with a uh, uh, fish and a tadpole that uh, they use very different sensories. So this fish uh, is a pretty visual fish and is known to respond heavily to visual stimulations. Tuples rely a lot on uh, biochemical communication. Uh, they are more or less blind. I mean, they do see, but much less than fish. So we knew that uh, the perception of these, uh, these stimulus uh, would have been slightly different between the two species. Not only the invasive uh, mosquito fish uh, was facing uh, a copy of the predator that comes from the environment where they come from, that is North America. So they have encoded in the genome that uh, this kind of profile of a predator is very bad because it kills them. Uh, it, it's in centuries in like, it has been since they were, uh, um, since this species was known as being predated by this fish. 
On the contrary, the tadpole is native of Australia, has never seen this predator in uh, North America. And there is a literature that shows that uh, when a species is naive of a predator, it's not capable to actually understand that it's actually dangerous. So one, one uh, tool to play here would be to be very careful with uh, which predator we copy so that uh, we can try to use our advantage of, uh, you know, trigger the innate fear in one species that knows the predator, but not in the others. But uh, again, a lot of theory, then you require a lot of experiments and validations. Thank you, Giovanni. Thank you. So there are other questions, but we are out of the time. So I 